Welcome to the panel, A Survival Guide to Alternative Film Distribution for South by Southwest. Um, a little bit different this year as we are virtual, um, but welcome everyone. This was actually a, a panel that we had uh, approved for last year, um, which just goes to show that these evolving and changing models have been something that's been happening um, before pandemic days, um, but obviously things are just accelerating even quicker now. So that's something that we'll be discussing in this panel. Um, I'm just gonna start by introducing everyone that is on the panel. Um, first, uh, Liz Manishill, who I know um, when she was the manager of Sundance's groundbreaking creative distribution initiative um, until it's closed in 2019. She is a distribution consultant, which she will talk about more later in the panel. And she's a writer filmmaker whose recent film, Speed of Life, uh, is now screening on Showtime. Uh, Tiffany Boyle, she is president of packaging and sales at Ramo Law, based in LA. And recently she has served as co-executive producer and brought in financing for films such as Something Else that was at Tribeca in 2019 and films such as Arkansas starring Liam Hemsworth and Vince Vaughn, as well as Chick Fight starring Melon Ackerman, Alec Baldwin and Bella Thorne. Uh, Nick Sava, he oversees Giant Pictures, a digital distribution label releasing movies and feature docs to streaming services in the US and worldwide. Um, prior to that, Nick led content acquisitions and di digital distribution at Tribeca Enterprises, the host company of Tribeca Film Festival. And recent films that he's been working on are Feels Good Man, Hashtag Like, Action USA, and upcoming films including Rock Camp, Black Holes, The Edge of All We Know, and Bromance, which he will talk about also in the panel. And then brief uh, about myself, um, I've gone to South by for over 15 years. Um, I am a freelance marketing consultant for companies such as Studio Canal out of the UK and the British Independent Film Awards also in the UK, which is where I reside. Um, I'm also a freelance journalist, videographer for film publications such as Screen International and Filmmaker Magazine. And I also have a film design company called Collective. So without further ado, uh, let's get into our evolving models. Um, I don't wanna talk too much, but uh, obviously with the pandemic, it's very obvious things are changing. We've seen all of the PVOD uh, premieres um, such as Universal, the Trolls World Tour, um, that broke records, um, Disney with Mulan, um, and then uh, later at the end of the year, Soul that went straight onto Disney Plus. And then of course, um, Warner Brothers, HBO Max, where Warner Brothers have said that they will release 17 films such as Dune and Matrix 4 across HBO Max for 31 days, the same day they, de they debut on screens, if, if they debut on screens. Um, and then in terms of box office, you know, because of the pandemic, it's this past year was 80% down from 2019, um, international was 71% down. So, um, but maybe also kind of interesting is, uh, at Sundance where we've seen many record breaking deals in the past few years from streaming sites, um, this past Sundance, while there was a, a, a big deal for Coda at 25 million from Apple and passing Rebecca Hall's debut for Netflix at just over 15 million, um, it seems that there was also a lot of deals from independent distributors, which shows that hopefully in the near future, there will again be more theatrical releases. So it seems like the playing field is uh, all over the place at the moment, but it's also, exciting, I think, for independent films. Um, I didn't know, Liz, if you wanted to give a little bit of a breakdown of a report that you've been working on. 
Yeah. Uh, so a few years, a few years ago, I worked with Rebecca Green, um, amazing producer, on an article where we interviewed 25 distributors and asked them questions like, uh, what's your average term length? How many rights do you acquire? Um, how can filmmakers approach you? Uh, do you feel optimistic about distribution? And we decided to do a sequel this year because they're uh, because things are crazy. I mean, things are nuts. It's hard to figure out the black box of distribution, right? And a lot of filmmakers don't even know an index of what distributors are out there. So what's interesting is, um, and I can't share too many uh, revelations because we want people to read the article, which will be out in February. So it's out now while you're watching this panel. But um, here's some data we can share. Uh, one is distributors are overwhelmed. They have furloughed a lot of staff. They're overworked. Um, their bandwidth is being tested. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge, acknowledge that at the top because um, that's gonna trickle down in terms of acquisitions and ability to communicate with filmmakers and do customized releases. In addition to that, we were asking about, you know, acquisition numbers. Have, has that increased from 2019 to 2021 and anticipated releases? So here's a little bit of data for you. Um, under the number of films acquired in 2019, of all the 39 distributors that we surveyed, the most popular answer was four to 10 titles. So that's interesting, right? You have a lot of films coming out in 2019, but um, a lot of distributors were only releasing, you know, under 10 titles. In 2020, the most popular answer was still four to 10 titles, but that percentage shrunk to 25.6%. And then the options that we gave of 21 to 30 titles or 30 plus titles increased in a very meaningful way. So distributors started to take on more content during the pandemic. I think a lot of filmmakers were also thinking creatively, maybe working um, in ways they wouldn't normally, taking deals they wouldn't normally take because their options may have been limited because we have, um, again, a crazy economy during this global pandemic. And then um, under anticipated number of releases in 2021, those numbers seem to climb even more to larger slates. So it's, again, you have this a perfect storm of overworked curators, overworked distributors. Filmmakers are still working on films. They're in post-production. Maybe they've extended that period. They're waiting to release their content till we have a marketplace after the pandemic. But they're starting to acknowledge that maybe waiting is not the best idea. And it's causing this really interesting influx of content, but, um, difficulty to release content because of the amount of titles. So there's a little anecdotal, there's a little actual data, but um, shit's crazy. Shit's crazy right now. So <laughs> I find it really, really interesting. I think, um, I mean, Tiffany, maybe you want to sort of um, come on the back of that because um, you've probably seen it kind of from many different sides as well. You know, are, are you seeing something similar? In terms of filmmakers, because there was a lot that was unpacked there that Liz yeah, said. Yeah, so sorry. So I specifically address, do you mean in terms of what filmmakers are kind of taking on versus what they might have before a pandemic? Yes, and that they're getting these sort of bigger, you know, distribution um, sort of loads, or, you know, and, and at the moment, not as many places to release these films. Yeah, I mean, I would say there were what happened with our clients is is a lot of filmmakers, you know, weren't able to shoot during the pandemic. So we ended up getting a lot of films that shot like right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we were really lucky where we had a lot of clients that luckily did that, and um, some of them already had distribution, and it wasn't much of a concern as to who they were going with, and more turned into a concern of we had a idea of a release plan that we could do, maybe that was theatrical, or maybe it was premiering at a certain festival, things like that. And now we have to tinker, like Arkansas is one of them. It was supposed to premiere on South by Southwest, Lionsgate, obviously was like, well, this isn't happening anymore. What are we doing now? And, and they, they figured it out and did a release. And um, thankfully, it's, a lot of people have seen it. 
but I think that there are a lot of filmmakers that are being creative about how, um, you know, they're finding their homes. And like Liz said, I think they're being more open to the homes that they're finding rather than saying, I need this big X amount of sale in order to feel comfortable. They're saying, okay, we understand there's a market that's different. And, um, you know, I think we might be willing to be more open on the terms and what they're going to look like and finding a partner that feels like they know how to navigate this versus throwing things against the wall, which to a certain extent, everybody's throwing things against the wall. Um, but hopefully some who are being more thoughtful about it than others. Um, and in terms of distributors that I'm seeing, like a lot of them are still very active. Yes, some of them may be more stretched thin, but um, you know, if it's the, they do want content, they're hungry for content, it's gotta still be the right thing for them to put up the big bucks, but they might be more creative with other movies if they're not, if they're not having to do that and they're doing more of a rev share deal. Um, so I think it's, it is a good time, especially now I have a lot of clients that were saying, well, let me, I wanna wait to see, you know, I hear that there's gonna be this I hear that there's going to be this uh, lack content of content. Drought. I hate that term, yeah. content there's, drought. There's going to be a lack of content in the in the industry for these these distributors, and I should wait to sell my movie until then. And I keep trying to tell them I I don't think it's as big of this lack of content as you think there is. Right? Um, I talked to I have a programmer friend who works at Tribeca, and she was saying we've gotten more submissions this year than we ever have. <laughs> Um, and I think that's sobering, right? It doesn't mean they're all the most amazing movie in the world, but I think it says something that like, even in a pandemic, there's more submissions ever than ever. Um, so yes, people can be more creative, distributors can be more creative, but it does not mean that um, you can take advantage of the marketplace from getting a better deal necessarily because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. I think you can maybe get a better distributor than you would have, but a better deal is a different story. That's a good segue, Nick, to you, um, which I want us to be able to show um, the the great uh, sort of breakdown that that you have that shows you know which companies are SVOD, TVOD, and sort of how it breaks down. But how how are you seeing um, things evolve? I mean, you were you were already at the forefront of this before pandemic. Um, yeah, thanks, Tiff. Um, yeah, uh, what uh, Liz and, and other Tiff uh, said definitely resonated with what I've seen uh, during the pandemic. Um, Giant Pictures, we're a um, division of a tech company called uh, Giant Interactive that you can see right behind me here. Um, uh, we're a digital aggregator, a kind of hybrid between an aggregator and a more traditional distributor. Um, and so, you know, we are quite boutique, um, taking on round about um, 40 or so new release movies per year, which might sound like a lot. I think in the, um, in, on Liz's list, that would be on, along, uh, on the high end, but um, for a digital only or a streaming company, that's a really, actually a really small number, which we do purposefully because we think we can, um, you know, we'll be able to concentrate more on each film without overloading ourselves. Um, but we are feeling uh, kind of overstretched, um, very much kind of what Liz was getting at. Um, there, there is a, um, there isn't a drought of content. There's more of a more of a glut of content really um, at the moment. And um, the other thing is that uh, both distributors like us and also the streaming platforms are actually slowing down like operationally as well. So um, one of the things I talk with filmmakers about all the time is to leave enough time to um, have delivery happen and pitching your film out to all of the relevant streaming platforms, which is probably about a four month period at this point to prep a digital release. Um, because a lot of the ops departments at the platforms have, have slowed down. Um, in terms of how they're able to process. Um, but yeah, we've we've definitely benefited um, one of the few companies really, uh, well, few areas of the industry uh, that have benefited during the pandemic because we're streaming only. Mm -hmm. And we saw um, a 40% increase in the usage, the streaming usage, pretty much when everyone went into lockdown last spring. Um, 
which has eased up a bit now, but certainly there was a huge amount of extra, you know, increased VOD usage throughout 2020. Um, you know, um, in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the point uh, Tiff Oil was making about um, whether um, filmmakers should wait to sell um, or to go right now because, um, you know, the idea that, there, that there's a real need for content. I think that what we've seen with particularly the SVOD and AVOD buyers, um, so that's, you know, um, all of what we would call the pay one buyers like Netflix, Hulu, um, HBO Max now, um, uh, uh, Peacock is starting to buy um, new release movies as well. There's more buyers, um, which is really good for independence. Um, and that's not really a pandemic thing. That's just kind of like a industry trends thing that I think that the acquisition cycles of these streaming platforms from what I've seen run in much longer cycles. And so almost like as soon as the pandemic hit, they a lot of platforms already had tons of titles lined up for like months. And they're often acquiring like, you know, up to a year or more in advance. And so the effects of any kind of droughts, let's say of content, which I don't believe that there has been anyway, but um, these sorts of effects take many, many months in order to filter through to the buying habits of these platforms. But I do think that in the more of the medium term, like over the next like year or two, there are gonna be more and more buyers needing more and more content. And that's very good for independence. I wanted to jump in really briefly, just from my perspective as a distribution consultant, because most of my clients are, I'm still workshopping this title, but are like mid-tier filmmakers. We get into regional film festivals. We may have a little bit of cast, but it's not Brad Pitt, you know? And I think there's always this idea that we can hack distribution and get on the elevator to A24 or Neon or, you know, this kind of level of prestige and revenue. And I think that's where the superstition regarding or the magical thinking regarding content drought comes from. But ultimately, at least in America, we're very much still in this like prestige pipeline where if you don't get into those top tier festivals or if you don't get into, if you don't have sincere name cast or strong genre um, association, you're, these, these benefits of, of economic breakthroughs are not gonna trickle down to the mid-tier filmmaker. We're still fucked is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge that, that it's um, when I have filmmakers say to me like, oh, that content drought. And I have to say to them, when has anything ever benefited the low budget indie filmmaker? And like, never, it's never. So you have yeah. to be creative about how you exploit your rights and cut down middlemen. That's definitely fair, Liz. But yeah, on, on the other hand, on the plus side, there are lots of new, like I said, new platforms uh, that have launched and new platforms coming mm -hmm. on. And also new kind of um, business models really for VOD that really weren't around like a few years ago, you know, like um, educational streaming, for example, yes. has been a public library streaming, which is free with a library card this has become like really um, popular, um, especially during the pandemic and um, is a really good, like there are these new routes to market for independent filmmakers. So I don't think, yeah, I mean, you don't need- I'm dramatic. I'm, yeah, I'm being a little dramatic. You're pulling me in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think that um, obviously when you have a premiere at a prestige film festival and, you know, um, some of those kind of badges of, of um, legitimacy that you mentioned, things kind of are easier and smoother in your path to distribution. But also with streaming, there are a lot of other avenues that you have to figure out how to tap them, but then, you know, you can, you can see some success. Are, are you guys finding that there's certain types of content like genre or, you know, Nick, you said documentary education, um, and Tiffany, I know you've talked about, you know, more upbeat, no one, no one wants to watch downbeat material right now. Are you finding that uh, certain types of material are obviously easier to get a deal? 
Yeah, um, right now I'm finding that comedy is doing pretty well. We get a lot of feedback. This is on the, you know, even in hopefully green lighting project side and all as well as um, distribution, people are wanting something lighter. They don't want to be depressed. They don't want to be sad. They want to really be taken away and, and um, have a good time. So anything that kind of reflects that. I think that thrillers and horrors kind of tend to always still do pretty well just translation wise from around the world um but yeah I c consistently seeing you know people used to tell me all the time like well comedies they're really hard to do because they don't always translate and now people are like we just want to be happy <laughs> I had here also talking about hybrid releases which is I mean obviously very like similar to virtual theatrical um I didn't know if Nick, or, you know, I mentioned hashtag like here, you know, if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, sure. Yeah, that, that's um, been a really successful, um, uh, like really small independent film without cast um, that has done really well on VOD. Um, and I credit Sarah uh, Pyrozek, who's the director um, in like, she kind of made that decision to just jump during the uh, pandemic and not to wait until traditional, um, you know, distribution kind of came back slash is ever coming back. Um, and so um, she did, you know, she, she really worked um, hard on uh, press um, and uh, digital marketing and PR. Um, she worked like, she has some really great marketing assets, which, for the film, which are just crucial for VOD, you know, like an excellent poster, um, the title is pretty cool, um, uh, excellent trailer, that 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 kind of stuff, and it has resonated. It's, it's um, you know, uh, we we worked with her to get um, uh, some really good um, visibility on Apple TV on their main movies page. I think. At some point it hit um, like top 30 overall movies on Apple TV, like including all studio movies. So mm -hmm. that, was a, that was really a great success. And then that kind of um, success will play out on a lot of other platforms as well. And she decided to just go pretty much as widely as possible on as many platforms kind of all at the same time around, um, around an, an initial release. So, you know, it, it looks a lot like kind of day and what we used to call like day and date releasing, you know, which is um, what used, again, used to be called in theaters now um, on VOD platforms. It's not called in theaters now anymore because there's no, films are not in theaters now. So uh, Apple is calling it like early release is like the name they have for it. Um, and so you've seen like a lot of experimentation with those kind of models as well. Um, and uh, not for hashtag like, but for other independent films, um, you're seeing like a lot more um, price point and windowing experimentation on VOD even than you were before. So like previously with that in theaters now price point, you had a 699 rental was kind of like, that was what that was all about. And now, partly because of uh, what Universal did earlier on in the pandemic with a couple of their films, like the Trolls sequel, I think was maybe the first one to do it. Mm -hmm. They had like a $29.99, which just seems super high transaction price to me. Or And then $19.99, a lot of companies have done. And the independents are now starting to do the same um, thing also. So you have really good companies like um, Vertical Entertainment, who are an excellent uh, distributor, like, like doing experimentation with that 1999 premium price point also. So, I mean, that, that's that been like pretty positive, I would say over the last few months of the platforms, especially have been way more open to that kind of experimentation, almost like whatever we want to pitch them in terms of the release plans of a particular film, they will be up for trying it. And I think that's been really positive. How did, um, I was reading the filmmaker article about hashtag like, mm -hmm. and she had a, a window before uh, the film was going out on Apple and digital channels where she decided to hire someone to help her 
get the film you know, self-distributed into cinemas. And I wasn't sure how many weeks she had it in cinemas or like was, was she allowed to have any crossover with the release on Apple? Yeah, it was, it was a really shortened um, window that she did. And I think she did it to um, just in like classic day and day fashion to build buzz around a particular timing, around a, a particular release timing. Like she recognized that you, especially as an independent film, you really just have one shot at the press um, and the marketing buzz. Um, budgets are often limited, of course, on independent films. And it does make sense and did make sense even before the pandemic to try to cluster all of that activity around a particular date. Um, Liz did the same thing on her awesome film, Speed of Life, which she should tell us about, which I was also involved in the distribution of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was actually thinking about this and I was thinking, you know, like a lot of the opportunities that came to our film were because were because they were primed before the pandemic hit, right? So it's like, y'all made the pitch to Showtime before um, March. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but what I wanted to say is the takeaway I'm hearing from my experience and Sarah's experience and inspired by filmmakers like Miami, uh, Naomi McDougal Jones in her film, Bite Me and Tom Huang in his film, Find Me is that there are ways for filmmakers to exploit theatrical um, or at least there were before the pandemic, to book theaters themselves. Um, a lot of distributors don't want to take on theatrical. They don't have those resources or they're, you know, they don't have the bandwidth. And um, filmmakers can book art houses themselves and create a, their own day and date or their own little tour. Um, Naima McDougal Jones, this is amazing, like, 30 city tour across the country where she and her a documentary crew and her, I think her husband lived in an RV for weeks and just traveled from theatrical engagement to theatrical engagement. And they inventized every single screening with a joyful vampire ball um, after the movie. And this is like something that we've all been tremendously inspired by. So because art house theaters have suffered so much, I'm really hoping that once we, um, are properly vaccinated and we can all leave our houses that um, we can work together with these art houses and actually, and maybe smaller independent theater chains um, to create a, a, a renaissance in an in indie theater art house exhibition. This is me, this is the optimistic Liz. So apparently the first half of the call was me being super pessimistic, but um, judging from stories like Sarah and me, Naomi and Tom, uh, there are ways you can exploit your, the rights that no one else wants <laughs> and to make a big difference with your film. So. And, and I was going to ask you too about regional bookings. Um, obviously Wiccan LA not fully open. Is that something that you're guiding filmmakers or they have to think about is, you know, how can you have a bigger presence in another state or... Um, booking exclusively at certain number of regional theaters. I could speak to that briefly and I'm sure everyone else has an opinion, but mm -hmm. um, that's what Naomi did. She concentrated on uh, what I hate people call the flyover states, right? It was the opportunity to bring alternative content to the Midwest, to the South, um, that a massive theatrical chain may not be bringing um, to those locations. And I booked my own theatrical just out of curiosity, just be like, can I do this? Can I just email an exhibitor and pitch my film? And I chose the Roxy in San Francisco because they're open-minded to supporting independent film and because I'm from the Bay Area. And I think using those local ties is like pivotal um, when you're doing pitches that have to do with geographic decisions. If you don't have a connection to an area, you have to do a little bit of a ground game to find people to be advocates in those locations for you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've definitely seen one that I like, I quote to this day, this movie came out 10 years ago, but they did such an amazing job with it. And I truly believe that like other people need to think like this. I had one client that did this movie called Home Run, which was somewhat of like a faith-based movie and um, baseball faith-based. And, um, and before we went to distributors, this very gung-ho with it producer went to 
churches all across um, the nation and got them to say, okay, if this movie comes out in our neighborhood or at a theater close to us, we will commit to make sure we buy a thousand tickets for our parishioners. So she walked in to a distributor with 200,000 tickets already pre-sold through these churches. Oh and gosh. it's brilliant. And more people need to think about how you access your base in that way, in my opinion. Just briefly, I can say that throughout our festival and theatrical run, and by theatrical run, I mean one theatrical engagement at the Roxy, we booked a David Bowie cover band to play before our films. And um, that was really, really effective because not only did it turn the screening room into a party before my weird dystopic sci-fi movie started, um, but you got to interact with the band beforehand, you got to collaborate with them and you got to capitalize on their following. So it was a great collaboration with another um, artistic teammate of your of your film. So I, if there's any way you can eventize with kind of that, for us, it was very low hanging fruit was to bring in a David Bowie cover band, but you could be creative. For, for people who haven't seen your movie Speed of Life, there is a Bowie element, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is where that comes in. Uh, Awesome. Um, yeah, um, I, I had a, a, a little uh, experience with some of the um, uh, regional and drive-in uh, bookings uh, theatrically um, with a film we worked on called um, Action USA, which I think we mentioned at the beginning. It's like a um, it's like a remastered, fully remastered in 4K re-release of a classic 80s kind of cult action movie. Um, it's it's awesome. Um, it was um, uh, Alamo Draft House, which is one of our uh, clients at Giant, was involved in the release, and also a new company called um, Verdugo Entertainment, who handled the restoration of it. But um, that film had like some really significant um, bookings in drive-ins all around the country. It was that sort of a it was that sort of a movie. Um, as well as virtual theatrical through um, through um, Alamo on Demand, the um, Alamo Draft House uh, VOD platform. Mm -hmm. um, it maybe also uh, leads us on to talking about some other um, types of themes in this environment, like these re-releases. Like I'm seeing nostalgia films, mm -hmm. and kind of like what Tiff Boyle was saying about everyone's like really wanting comedy and things that are really gonna take them away at the moment. And I've seen the same thing with like nostalgia plays as well, like Action USA definitely was one of those. And then another movie uh, which is super successful as a re-release that we were involved in uh, called Rad, um, which was released by Utopia Distribution, um, which um, really capitalized also on from what Liz was saying about, or sorry, Tiff, other Tiff was saying about um, kind of rallying your base, if you like, of, of supporters. Um, rap, like a really inbuilt, rabid um, fan base from like all these years of like bootleg copies circulating on VHS and the film not really being available, et cetera. And then when that film was again remastered and re released by Utopia Distribution. It was, um, there was like an inbuilt audience just waiting for it to drop. And then again, like very quickly out onto VOD where it did incredible numbers, mm. uh, which I was not expecting it to do as well as it did. And that, Tiff, you, I mean, you told me this even uh, last year, seeing some staggering numbers in terms of um, uh, uh, what was the Italian release you told me about? Um, I don't know if it was a restoration release or. It was, yeah, my uh, husband works at a foreign sales company. So they had a movie that they um, uh, hired basically they started putting some of these out through Italy uh, the beginning of the pandemic last year and in one month it was an older title at least like seven years old and in one month they made like 12 grand on that title from a movie that's just been sitting there for seven years um, so they were really able to take advantage in some ways of what was happening and people sitting in their houses and not being able to go anywhere and reinvent reinvigorate those movies and what would be an example of what you normally would make 
or you know a figure. normally that movie wouldn't have been out in Italy <laughs> yeah. Yeah. hero is the normal yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, that's a whole other topic is uh, films that normally would not have had any type of release. Uh, you know, suddenly now people need content and um, are taking on board all types of projects. Yeah, um, I, think, I, I think that the fact still remains is it needs to have, you know, the right co commercial look as well as the right cast, right? So some of these older movies that maybe maybe wouldn't be doing anything if they have the right cast and you can kind of kind of put that up it, it could be reinvigorated yeah I think that's really interesting but I also <clears throat> tip also to talk about um the role of the sales agent in all mm -hmm. of this um which I know lots of different thoughts on how a sales agent can help an you know an independent filmmaker and especially at this time and what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is definitely a reason to still have a sales agent for the right type of movie, right? If it has a certain level of cast, if it's something that feels more global rather than domestic. Um, and if it's something where you're not looking for a worldwide sale, like how there's those movies out there that are going worldwide to Amazon or Netflix or Hulu, et cetera. So there, there's definitely a good reason to have a sales agent if you're one of those types of films. Outside of that, I think that there is a growing shift and sales agents are really dealing with how to adjust um, with the fact that those sometimes those really big movies just go straight to um, the, uh, the streamers where they didn't have that before and they used to be the conduit for those. Um, and then sometimes, you know, there's movies where they're just so small, they don't have a big enough cast or they don't have the, like, like the right elements that make it a territory by territory sale worthy film. Um, I often have been advising a lot of my clients now because of the added expenses with those sales agents and um, you know the fees that come along with it to try and find a deal where maybe there's a distributor and a lot more distributors are doing this um, like Blue Fox, even Gravitas, right? Where they're taking on movies and, and putting them out worldwide. Um, on the platforms that they can. So depending on the movie, uh, I ad I kind of advise accordingly, but I also think that that is definitely a shift where five years ago, some of these smaller films that don't have cast, you could still see money out of them and it still made sense for a sales agent. And for a sales agent themselves, it, it doesn't always make sense to take on those movies just because it doesn't warrant enough income. And then you have disgruntled filmmakers and it's just no fun for anybody. Um, I just want to acknowledge what um, a little bit about the sales agent conversation we're having, because I think there is a certain level of filmmaker, just like Tiffany was saying, that may not benefit from the sales agent as wonderful as they are, um, but just it won't be a profitable scenario for them. And in this article I did where I interviewed the 39 distributors, more distributors gave their direct email address when I said, mm -hmm. how can filmmakers contact you? They were like, I mean, I'll tell you right now, because you could read the article, they were like, just contact Evan at Wolf Video. Here's his email address. Or like uh, Magnolia gave a direct email address. It was shocking to me how we we're actually cracking open those doors a little bit in terms of filmmaker, distributor, or, and I call filmmaker inclusive of producers as well. So filmmaker and distributor direct contact. And um, this seems to be an evolution from what happened before the pandemic, these breaking down of the walls of the old world of distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely a value, of course, to sales agents. And I know some of us are related to sales agents on this call. So I want to make sure that we don't um, in any way devalue them. Yeah. Um, but um, in my experience, I've never worked with a sales agent because my films do not have international appeal. Um, I'm trying to cut down as many... Um, middle men and middle women, because in my case, those pitches would not be successful pitches. Um, and having like a realistic expectation of your film's reach, I think is really important. And then I just finished uh, consulting with all these amazing international filmmakers and their, the release of their titles would be nothing without the sales agents. You know, it's like their entire release patterns are 100% uh, dependent on a fabulous sales agent. So it's just really interesting when you look at how people handle things internationally versus how we do things in the US, there seems to be a breaking down of those or a dissolving of those walls. Um, yeah, and it, I, 
I, to, to that point, right? A lot of sales agents too are sometimes acting like a domestic rep, like a CA or Endeavor content. I, I work with Voltage a lot and they got one of my clients like a great multi-territory Netflix sale. Um, so, you know, that they have the ability to do these. And again, to that point, it just depends on the film and, and their expenses and really what makes sense. I'm cheap. So that's also part of it too. <laughs> Um, that is a conversation we we could probably just keep going on and on about. Um, I, I'm just going through some of the other topics that we did talk about, but I thought it was interesting too on um, how previously you could maybe rely on in-flight hotels, cruise ship uh, financing uh, support, and, and it sounds like that's not necessarily the case now. I think a lot of those models are seriously challenged, like you know, obviously during the pandemic, like in-flight in particular has massively struggled, um, which is not good uh, because that was a pretty dependable source before. And like you said, also for financing. But um, on the other hand, I go back to just, there are other avenues that filmmakers and producers can kind of tap into now, uh, which weren't there like five years ago, like, you know, AVOD and um, educational and I was talking with you uh, Tiff Pritchard about um, DVD like MOD DVD yeah. manufacture on demand it's like another acronym that I don't know if we need any more acronyms <laughs> um, but it's basically you know um, this idea of like printing on demand and printing and shipping like one particular disc to a consumer who makes a purchase on Amazon or Barnes and Noble's website or Walmart's website, et cetera. And that, that has massively lowered the entry cost to, um, you know, a, a means of distribution that people thought was dead, like what people were saying was dead. It never really was. Physical DVD and Blu-ray is like, has always been there um, in some form or another, but, with like now with MOD, you have the cost of entry massively lowered, which it now makes sense for an independent, almost any independent film to do that kind of release. So there are some new routes as well. Liz, did you, I know you had, did you have anything else about that? Or um, I mean, yeah, I, in, airline deals for my first feature were like one fourth of the revenue. It was a very big deal uh, for us. And it was, and I think a lot of filmmakers don't even know that airlines and cruise ships and prisons were an option for ancillary revenue before the pandemic. And now it's like, oh, bummer. That was something that they missed out on even though they didn't even know was there. Um, I have to say though, for, I negotiated my, my own, I pitched to an airline aggregator myself for my uh, first speed of life. And we just made some sales to merchant ships and trains. So I was, and we're on Air Force One. I mean, these are very weird things <laughs> that I found out. So while certainly it's a, a dangerous time for all of these platforms, I couldn't believe that we were still making sales. So it is, it's still happening, even if it's a lot uh, at a reduced, reduced rate. And I, I just wanted to go back also, Nick, to the DVD side of things, because, well, Tiff, this will also tap into traditional distribution, which I do want you to talk about. But I know, like, being at Studio Canal, it's still very much a sort of, um, you know, process of we have the theatrical, and then we have our DVD, our home end, and then we go into TVOD, SVOD. Um, is that, you know, and maybe, Tiff, this is where you could segue into the traditional side, but is that something that is still uh, a model that you're seeing or, or Nick, you could talk about that too, I suppose, on, on your side, but. Yeah, it's, it, I work really almost exclusively in like, um, with like US based independent filmmakers and their distribution strategies, which are nowadays like very far from that traditional we're doing like there there is a I was saying earlier on there is a um some argument for windowing theatrical in 
normal times, but these are definitely not normal times. And there's like much more experimentation um, possible. And I think that if you're following for like smaller independent films, if you shouldn't be beholden to that like traditional windowed mm -hmm. way anymore, because um, it is outmoded and you can make a much bigger splash um, with different release models. Yeah, I mean, for me, like they, there's obviously less of a traditional release at the moment, but there are still movies that minus a theatrical are getting otherwise a traditional release. Um, like Chick Fight is one of them, right? Like it came out traditionally in November, they did a window, 60 to whatever days later, 75 days later, it came out in June on Amazon and they were opening that up to the world and they're doing all of that traditional windowing and they're doing all the traditional marketing behind it. They put it up on like UFC women's championships and they promoted it that way. They did um, like Bella Thorne has like 37 million followers and stuff like that, you know? So they used the following fan base and they did a lot of that type of promotion. And so in every way, like that to me was outside of the theatrical traditional. So I think a lot of distributors, again, like in a cast driven movie that feels it was a comedy, right? It feels right for the times of what people want. They're still sticking with that where they can because they'll make more money out of it if they can that way. But um, to Nick's point, I think a lot of people are just getting creative and, and the, the windows are collapsing depending on, like, I think Promising Young Woman is a really interesting model of, of how they did it, right? They did kind of like that premium pricing, right, Nick? Did you watch Promising Young Woman? No, but I, I read a bit about it, sure. Um, and they did like the premium pricing and then they dropped it. And, um, you know, I couldn't wait. I like made us do the earlier <laughs> pricing instead of waiting. Um, but I think a lot of distributors are getting creative that way. How, I mean, that could also be, um, you know, once things kind of settle down, how how much of these trends, you know, like the drive-ins or um, you know the, the the windowing, how much of this do you think is going to keep going? This sort of alternative structure. I think that's uh, okay. Go ahead, whoever wants to start. Oh, I, I I just think like there's definitely has been a complete watershed change and it's never going to go back to exactly what it was before. I don't think that the studios, are, now that they've been able to break the theatrical window, are going to want to go back. They might get forced to go back. I don't know. But um, uh, that was like a huge, huge moment with, especially with what Warner uh, did with the 2021 theatrical slate, as you said, Tiffany uh, P at the beginning. Um, I think that that's like something that you can't come back from and you shouldn't want to come back from and things are going to be much more interesting and creative in the future. Yeah, I, I hope things like the drive throughs kind of stick around and they keep finding ways, you know, if independent films keep finding ways to figure out a way to, to make those work and, and utilize the literal space that exists for them. Um, you know, I, I, there's another distributor that we know that where they've been really savvy during the, um, during the pandemic and when there were certain theaters that opened up, they were able to release in like 300 screens for movies that they never expected to be able to do so. So I think there's always gonna be people finding these avenues and being creative and working on, you know, getting the best, more buck for their film and getting it out there as much as possible. But um, I hope some of some of it stays, right? Like the, I, I, I love the drive-through model and things like that. So I do hope some of it sticks around. Yeah, Liz, from, from your side, it's interesting. Oh, go on. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, but I think from a DIY sort of, mm -hmm. or, you know, um, self distribution, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I think before the pandemic, the, uh, the willingness to be open minded to things like self distribution or splitting up your rights was slow going. And I think in this reckoning that we've had of the pandemic there have been more filmmakers who are willing to work with aggregators, more, filling, more filmmakers that are willing to start getting involved in the marketing and distribution of their films. 
Um, it's part of my own personal mission to shine a light and hold certain distributors accountable for their uh, the way they've um, handcuffed filmmakers throughout the years with these long-term lengths and these complicated contracts that I think are often um, exploiting the artistic labor of filmmakers. But that's another panel. We don't have to get into that. But my, my point is that um, I think there... There's a lot of independent distribution consultants like me, you know, Mia Bruno, Rebecca Sosa. There's a lot of us that um, have come in and we're really trying to be advocates and support system for filmmakers who are left out of the traditional mainstream distribution game. And this is the time when a lot of them are getting involved because of the way our industry is um, coming to an inflection point. Uh, so I think it's exciting and it's just an evolution of what was happening before the pandemic. Um, Liz, I actually have a question for you because yes. I feel like I can't, when, when I have a client that comes to me and says, I want to maybe release this um, on my own, right? I want to do a self, self-distribution. I'm often saying that's fine and I think you can explore that, but you need to be prepared that this is a full-time job. Would you yeah. say that that is... Of course, 100%. And it really depends about the expectations, right? I mean, like, um, if you read the Thunder Road case study, and you see that that film, um, you know, did gangbusters everywhere, and it's this massive success story, and you think, well, I'm going to do it too. I love that energy. I love that enthusiasm. But do you have your own company of five individuals who are all hustling on behalf of the film? Um, most likely not. So there's also independent vendors that we're all of us consultants are recommending, you know, social media managers to add to your team, outreach coordinators to add to your team. Self-distribution is actually, it should be called team distribution, independent mm -hmm. team distribution. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. Absolutely not. It's exhausting. Um, but at the very least, you'll have control over, um, over your release plan and you'll get to reap the rewards in a way that I think is, is kind of exciting. Yeah, we represent the the Vanishing Angle guys that did Thunder Road, and yeah, they yeah. now basically distribute a lot of their own stuff because they built the model. <laughs> and they're yes. like, we're, we're we're sticking with this, but it's it's a long road to get there. Yeah, and things like crowdfunded equity, I think, are mm -hmm. are part of that too, right? Like they use WeFunder on a lot of their recent projects, and and I'm a big fan of crowdfunding in general, and I think that those again are these. Um, I don't even know, like harbingers of a new system that eventually may come to pass or maybe will always be in this kind of one foot in, one foot out hybrid system where some people are going at it on their own. Some people are using the infrastructure that we have here in Hollywood. How, Nick, I have a question. Um, as there are now so many platforms and which is amazing, but also really overwhelming for consumers. Mm. How are you going to see that change like they've been talking about bundling forever or um yeah, yeah. how do you see that? <clears throat> um i'm not sure if anyone really knows at the moment but there are some some good trends like i've mentioned around avod you know free with ads um where you have some kind of like platform aggregators like uh, pluto tv or zumo where um you know, they're offering like an electronic programming guide of probably like 200 channels, something like that. Because Pluto, for example, is owned by um, Viacom, CBS. You have a lot of kind of um, those types of channels from that corporation, you know, like um, within their lineup, Zumo is owned by Comcast and NBCU. So you're going to see more and more NBC type properties. So there, there is more and more um, like true like what we call OTT, you know, over the top um, ways to not have cable, but still have a bundle of channels. Um, so I think that's kind of inevitable, but it's at the moment, it's a real like explosion of just new op opportunities. And I, I really, um, I mean, I'm extremely optimistic for, about the opportunities for independence and um, that's because I'm like directly involved in distributing them. Like I'm seeing that, you know, we're doing, we have like 40 or 50 different platforms that we like send content to on a regular basis, like every month. And that list is just growing and it doesn't seem to have 
signs of stopping. So um, I think it's a it's a really um, you know it's really a boom time for independence. I think I think that will cover us for a good hour. See you later. Okay. Guys. okay. Thanks, Bye. guys. Thank you.